Uh, but I hope it won't prevent you from uh, turning your cameras on. Uh, so, to introduce our uh, speaker, uh, Professor Andreas Filippopoulos Mihalopoulos is a professor of law and theory at the University of Westminster in the United Kingdom and founder and director of the Westminster Law and Theory Lab as well as permanently affiliated to the University Institute of Architecture in Venice since 2009. His research interests are interdisciplinary and include space, bodies, radical ontologies, post-humanist studies, critical autopsies, li literature, psych psychoanalysis, continental philosophy, gender studies, art theory, and of course, your connection to the law. He has been awarded with the Oxford University Press National Prize for Law Teacher of the Year in 2011. His academic books include The Monographs, Absent Environments uh, from 2007, Nicholas Lumen, Law Justice Society from 2009, and Spatial Justice, Body, Lowscape, Atmosphere from 2014, and multiple edited anthologies. His work has been translated in various languages. He's currently working on a monograph on material justice. Andreas is also an artist working with performance, photography, text and installation, as well as sculpture and painting. He has performed at the opening of the 58th Venice Art Biennale in 2019, the 16th Venice Architecture Biennale in 2016, the Tate Modern, Inotim Instituto de Arte Contemporanea in Brazil, the Danish Royal Cast Collection, the Royal Academy of Sweden, and other institutions. He has shown his photography and text, Pickpocket on Instagram, in group shows at the London College of Communication, the Arbeit Gallery, the Palais de Tokyo in Paris, a publication on air as part of the Thomas Sarceno Carte Blanche show, uh, Unit 24 gallery, and in his solo show, The Iron Books, Poems for the Posthuman at Gasoline Rooms London. He's currently working on an installation on the lowscape for the Venice Architecture Biennale with the Daniel Arnaud Gallery. His artist book, A Fjord Eating Its Way Into My Arm, is published by End Publisher, Cent Publishers, Central St. Martins, London. He's also a fiction author with his book, the Book of Water, published initially in Greek and translated to be published in, Greek, in English by Eris Press in late in June this year. Andreas, uh, feel free to take it away. Uh, outside, yet we forget this. How lonely it is that we forget. There is no outside, yet we forget this. How lovely. It is that we forget. There is no outside, yet we forget this. How lovely it is that we forget. There now outside, yet we forget this. How lovely it is that we forget. There is no outside, yet we forget this. How lovely it is that we forget. There 
There is no outside, yet we forget this. Oh, lovely, it is that we forget. There's no outside, yet we forget this. How lovely it is that we forget. No outside means no other world but this one. No outside means we can only live an imminent experience. No outside means we have all we need right here. No outside also means no escape. No escape which is not already inscribed within. No outside means that the inside can feel asphyxiating, impossibly narrow, isolated, or indeed vast, infinite unnavigable. We have to live with our ontological anxiety, glossophobia and agoraphobia battling at the edge of our skins. But this is too much to ask. We dream of an outside, a better world perhaps, somewhere there. Another chance and so we readily forget how lovely it is that we forget, sings Nietzsche, sings Zarathustra. We need to forget in order to get by. We need to rupture this vast continuum of the inside that includes space, time, our cities, our laws, human and non-human bodies, their movement, their rest and their vanishing. We need to have clocks to break up time, meters and inches to break up space, categories to help us navigate the plethora of bodies. We need deadlines and origins, borders and walls, skin that separates. All these unnecessary ruptures to the vast ontological continuum means of navigation, identity givers, even reasons to include and exclude. These are all ways to forget. But we're becoming too good at forgetting, in fact, so good that we have immersed ourselves in total delusion about this desired outside. So welcome to this inside outside. Today I'm offering you three gifts, but every gift is also potentially poison, as Medea has told us. You need to be careful with them, because they might hurt you and others. These gifts are weapons, means of thinking, moving, staying put, resisting or accepting. They have no inherent direction or a priori moral value. They become different depending on where they find themselves. They are crying for the taking up of responsibility. The first gift I'm going to show you is the gift of the lawscape. Lawscape is this rather odd sort of formulation of law and space. This law and space, this way of thinking about law and space, and especially law in the city, it offers us a little toy and allows us to build worlds with it, but might also bring about repression, fear, or confusion. It's a tool that appears and disappears 
and moves up or down, this first gift, the lawscape, is what I've defined as the tautology between law and the city. This tautology points to legal imperialism. That's Austin Sarratt's reminding us of a law that is everywhere. It's not just a comment on the current state of societal juridification, but also a veritable expression of law's self-description, maybe self-delusion. This totalizing view has as a consequence some anticipated misdescriptions. First, the law is a reliable panacea for society's conflicts. And second, the law's monopoly on normativity allows and calls for blanket applicability. The way to avoid such totalizations is by counterposing law to other disciplines. Thus, the and of the title of this conference, Law and the City, and exactly the same title that I gave to one of the first books I published, Law and the City, as this edited collection of lawscapes, allowed us to think about continuum between law and the city and the rupture of the difference between them. The difference operates as a limiting factor of the tautology between law and the city, and is manifested on the side of the law in three interlinked ways as boundaries of law's colonizing presence, as limitations of law's perceived societal relevance, and as internal ruptures to a perceived ability and need for a uniform, homogeneous, and universalizing normativity. Law in the city allows us to play with space and normativity at the same time, to accept that there's no law that can meaningfully operate outside an urban context. This doesn't mean that there are no rural laws, but there's something about the way the law is produced, tested, and indeed ruptured within the urban that makes it. If law is about differences of space and spatial allocation between various bodies, human and non-human, what's better testing ground than the city to really understand how the law operates? Of course, any attempted confluence between law and the city is an exercise in anxiety. It's, it's where two potentially infinite values perform acrobatics of control and excess, constantly checking on each other's limits and limitations. These acrobatics between law and the city is a palpitating boundary between continuum and difference. On the epistemological level, the link is tangible. The one operates as a means of better understanding the other. As law's obsession with naming, categorizing, organizing, and tidying up is revealed in the city's working order of some laws of that. Conversely, the city's multipolarity and social differentiation to a city-dependent degree helps visualize the material side of the law, namely its relation to violence in the sense of its force of perception or application, its attempt to control power struggles, and its role in the process of capital production and consumption. In the city, law's presence is magnified to a deafening extent, so much so that one no longer feels its presence. Burning restrictions, environmental regulations, zoning, social control, borders between private and public and restricted access areas, pavements, roads, traffic lights, metro barriers, flow of people, headscarves at schools, hoods in shopping malls, power architecture and landscaping are just a few of the urban legal moments. In the city, the law tests itself. It becomes its loudspeaker and its gaming, its gaming table. The law becomes this big metallic ruler and makes its presence felt through inches and centimeters of propinquity distance, determining identity, determining one's own space, one's own body, the way that one's body moves in the city, 
in relation to other bodies, other beings, urban objects, urban desires, urban fears, and whatever is imagined to be outside the urban. There is no outside, yet we forget this. How lovely it is that we forget. When I talk about bodies, I talk about human and non-human bodies. When I talk about space, I talk about the space that is around us, but also the space of the bodies themselves. I talk about the space that is produced when our bodies move or are in pause. When I talk about law, I talk about... <laughs> I talk about... Maybe I talk about language? No. No. I talk about movement. I talk about the way that law inscribes itself onto our bodies and to other bodies. And then at the same time, it raises itself. It becomes the way that our bodies communicate with each other. It is a way of escaping as well as writing ourselves deeply into the law. The law is not just the text, it's not even just the context. The law is our bodies. We carry it in our bodies. There's no law outside the space of our bodies. There's no space outside that law. Law and space, law and the city, are tautological. Law and the city, of course, have always been together. The idea of the first city is also the moment in which the law emerges, as it were, for the first time, even biblical times. Cain established the first city. This first city, the first city of the world, is the one that saved us from the outside. But at the same time, it's the thing that kind of instituted the outside, established the outside. Please make in, sure your light source is placed onto your Established it outside in a way Please that we couldn't establish sure it outside. Make sure your light source is placed onto your left. Establish it outside. Please make sure your light source is placed onto your left. Please. Please, please make sure please your make camera sure. is pointing directly at you and please. not at an angle. Please make sure. Please make sure your camera is pointing directly please at make sure. you and not at an angle. Please make sure that your please make sure your face is always on the right part of the screen, leaving about two thirds of your screen free for the background. Please make sure that. Please yours. make sure your face is always on the right part on the right of part. the screen. The right part. Leaving about two thirds of your screen free for the background. Yes. Please make sure that your face allows the same distance between the top and the bottom edge of your screen. Yes. Please do not move your hands or arms, nor bring them up onto the screen. Oh. Please do not move your shoulders. Please look at the camera and not at your image. Now, start moving your head or parts of your face in a repetitive mode. Now, try to find your own move while respecting all the previous norms. Now try to find your own head move while respecting all the previous norms. Now repeat. Now repeat. Now try to see what others are doing 
without moving your head. Now, try to see what others are doing without moving your head. Now, try to imitate them. Now, try to do the same as they do. Now, always respect the norms. Now, try to imitate them. Now, repeat. Now, repeat. Now, repeat. Please make sure your light source is placed onto your left. The Please. second gift is a bit stranger. It's a little bit like, um, like an invitation. It's quite lovely to hold and comfortable, indeed natural, or at least inevitable. It feels like a soft blanket. One places one one's blanket around oneself, especially in cool evenings. That's what we need sometimes. But it's imperative that we do not dwell on this feeling for too long. For otherwise we become enslaved. This gift needs to be treated in a not judgmental, understanding way. We all need a little soft blanket at points, but also with suspicion. The second gift is the gift of the atmosphere. An atmosphere is what brings together the various bodies and keeps them together for as long as it can. An atmosphere is sensorial, an atmosphere is symbolic, an atmosphere is emotional. It is a glue that keeps bodies together, that circulates in between bodies. The way that bodies are brought together in an atmosphere is not necessarily benign, not necessarily a community-like way. Atmosphere excludes and burns anything that approaches it. Atmosphere is an engineered bubble of self-containment and consequent exclusion of anything that does not fit the very atmosphere. An urban atmosphere is multiple, but at the same time, it can exclude, it does exclude. An atmosphere is something we need and indeed constantly construct in our homes, our restaurants, our cities, our planet. It is something regularly co-opted and engineered towards excessive and needless consumerism, sense of passivity and political apathy, fear and hate of the other outside, whether that's the refugee, the indigenous, the other politically, religiously, culturally, etc. An atmosphere operates through affect. An affect is the informational, emotional, and sensorial circulation between bodies, within bodies. Affect is the nonverbal communication that we all perceive, but that exceeds us. It comes from our bodies, but it exceeds the bodies of its origin. affect is what you get now you get a uh, you get me you get an emotion but you also get the stuff you have around you you're not with me you are in two places at the same time an affect at the same time expresses desire and the desire could be either to be somewhere or not to be there to be somewhere else it's a desire to move or to stay put. It's a desire to possess, to have, or to lose. Sloterdijk, referring to Dostoevsky, talks about this glass house atmospheric phenomenon and says that eternal peace in this crystal palace would mentally compromise all its inhabitants. We are being compromised. In the city, affects become too excessive to be controlled, and when aggregated in the form of an atmosphere, they change in volatile ways. Urban atmosphere is a risky thing, full of incalculable factors. Nigel Thrift describes cities as rolling maelstroms of effect. 
So an atmosphere is produced by a partitioning of sorts. You bring different materialities together. But these materialities blend into each other. It's not easy to distinguish bodies. We think that our skin separates us. But the skin contains pores. The skin allows circulation, the inside and the out, to become one. Of course, we know that there is no outside. But an atmosphere does exactly that. It tells us, look, there is an outside. And we can leave it there because you're safe inside. This is the most dangerous aspect of an atmosphere. But the participating bodies in an atmosphere desire the very continuation of the atmosphere at the expense of whatever it might not be included in the atmosphere, in the perpetuation of precisely these made up boundaries between atmospheric bubbles. I don't want, I don't, I don't want this. I need my blanket. I don't want to dissolve. I need solidity identity. And we do. But that's not a good enough reason to carry on the way we are. So every lawscape, when it grows up, it wants to become an atmosphere. Atmosphere appears to be the perfect lawscape where law takes a nap, because the law has finally done what is expected to be done. A perfect atmosphere is the city of God. The idea of a city which is not just up there heavenly, but also where every single person, every single object has found its perfect emplacement. There's nothing, nothing else to be expected or to be done with it. We are exactly where we must be. Where else? This is the city of God. This is a divine city. There's nothing outside it, there's nothing inside it, except is that order? Can you hear? Everyone sings. That's the idea of perfect emplacement. What else is there to do? We sing. What is, what's the problem with the city of God? is that it simply is boring. We don't want the perfect emplacement. We want to carry on with difference. We want to carry on perhaps with even conflict. And that's why law is there to help us understand what conflict is productive and which conflict isn't, which conflict becomes a real problem where it tears bodies apart. Please make sure oh, what, that your I, camera what's, is about is, 50 centimeters away from your uh, what is? What Please is important? Make sure that your camera is about 50 centimeters away from your body. Can you just do this, please? Can you do that with me? Please make sure. Please make that sure. Your face always appears on the screen. Can you do that with me? Is that something you can do? Please make sure that your camera is about 50 centimeters away from your body. Why am I following this? Please make sure that your camera is about 50 centimeters Maybe I want away to belong. from your body. Maybe I want to be part of it. Maybe I want to Please make out. sure that your face always appears maybe on the I screen. Maybe I don't want to lose you, or maybe I don't want to lose myself. So Please make sure that your face always appears on the screen. So I now, bring... Try to show your whole some rules body there. on the screen. I bring some rules. Now try I to show rules. your whole body on the screen. I make rules, but as I move, I carry on with the this making. The whole screen must be taken up entirely by your body. The whole screen must be your body. Please leave no empty 
room on the screen. Please allow your body to take up all the space on the screen. Please remember your face must always appear on the screen. And now we have to withdraw. We've arrived to the third gift. We need to juggle this gift. Now in one hand, now in the other. It cannot remain in one for too long. It requires movement, constant questioning. If it stays somewhere for too long, it becomes frozen, coagulated. It becomes an atmosphere. We don't want that. We really don't want that. We had enough of atmospheres. We had enough of our comfort zones. We need to carry on moving. The third gift is the gift of spatial justice. Spatial justice is a, um, is a very difficult concept because at the same time, it allows one to think and believe in the possibility of justice, to think and believe in the possibility of just emplacement. However, at the same time, it betrays these expectations. So spatial justice, the way I define it, is the question that arises when a body wants to be at exactly the same space and at exactly the same time as another body. It is the desire of a body to move into the space of another body. The bodies are collective. We're not talking about a binary here. We're talking about a fold. We're talking about multiple bodies coming together or vying against each other for exactly the same space at exactly the same time. It can be achieved, but needs to be constantly questioned. It's not an answer. It is a question. It is not a state of being. It's a state of movement. Spatial justice demands that we take responsibility for our spatial positions with regards to ourselves, to the production of space, through our bodies, to the production of law through our bodies. It is not about who came here first. It is about opening up to the question of why should we think that we have more or better right to this space than others? Is it because we came here first? Really? Spatial justice is in the core of all contemporary issues that involve bodies moving in space. So everything is related to the question of spatial justice, global geopolitical issues of territorial claims and access to resources, quotidian situations of the way in which we behave towards other bodies, your neighbor, your friend, the way you use the bathroom or the kitchen. Spatial justice emerges from within an atmosphere as a gesture of withdrawal from the atmosphere. Spatial justice, the right to question can only take place when one withdraws from the numbing atmospherics of unquestionable positions. The act of withdrawal, not a passive act of surrendering, but on the contrary, a revolutionary act that as Nietzsche and Deleuze and Guattari after him have called the moment that the revolutionary leaves and takes the curtain with her. It is the moment where the regime falls but maybe it won't fall. Maybe the regime will stand because the regimes are much, much more flexible and much more solid than curtains. But we have to withdraw. We have to keep on moving. Of course, the question is this, where do we draw to? As we know, there is no outside. So we're drawing from an atmosphere simply lands us to yet another atmosphere, or at best, a lawscape, where we can actually still maneuver and manipulate a little bit this balance between law and space. 
So when we decide the law is too much, we decide that the city is simply a space of ludic pleasures. When we decide that the ludic pleasures have become too much, then we start instituting laws, measures of distance and propinquity. So spatial justice is a very difficult concept because it promises, but simply doesn't always deliver. We feel, we might be feel, feel cheated if we don't achieve what spatial justice is promising. But to be honest, I don't think the spatial justice is actually really promising anything. It just opens up some possibilities for us. It just makes us constantly question what it is and why it is that we are where we are. This is a very difficult concept because we want solutions. We're legal academics, and we often desire an answer to the questions. But, you know, sometimes there is no answer. Sometimes the kind of answer that there is, is somewhere a little bit hidden. The point, the point is that whatever we do, we have to keep on moving. If we think that we found spatial justice, if we think that we have found this one space where everything becomes just and right. If we think that we have just about touched that beautiful moment of the just city where everything has found its rightful place. That's a moment of withdrawal. That's a moment where we must throw ourselves back into that atmospherics into that fight with other bodies, trying to think why we think we have the right to shut our doors at night. Try to think why we have the right to shut our boundaries. Why borders? Why immigration? Why distinction and difference? And then when we found a way through law to understand all that, ah, then, then something happens and then something emerges. And this emerging thing might be, yeah, might be a, just a, a pause, a space of, okay, now I can, I can touch it again. I can feel it. Maybe, maybe this is it. Maybe we have reached that moment of justice. Maybe, maybe I can pause here for just a little while, just a little. This digital space includes me and excludes me. I feel that I want to touch you and I want to feel who is next to me on the screen here. Maybe somebody is, maybe somebody isn't. Maybe I'm spotlighted and it's very lonely up here. Or maybe I'm not, maybe I'm touching somebody's shoulder here. And then if I do this, maybe I, I might touch somebody's foot. This digital space, which has been created pretty much exactly as physical space, it tries to fool us. It tries to make us feel connected, feel together, feel one. Yeah, and you know what? Somehow it happens. Yes, we're feeling together. Can you feel the community that is created here? So maybe this is also an atmosphere. We have access to the digital. We have access to this conference. We have access to our voices. And maybe this is the right time to start questioning. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh Thank you very much, Andreas, for this uh, fantastic and uh, thought-provoking and I don't know even where to start uh, with regards to your presentation. And uh, I have, uh, I think, so many uh, things to ask uh, for you right now. I'm pretty sure that uh, others have as well. 
Uh, so I'll start since I'm <laughs> sharing, uh, but uh, the rest of you, please feel free to, to prepare your questions and uh, write them in the chats or uh, just unmute yourself and ask them uh, in a couple of minutes. Uh, so uh, thank you once again, Andreas. This, yeah, it uh, really shows us uh, well that uh, this uh, Zoom space, a digital space where we are enclosed is uh, has less limits, fewer limits than, than I think we, we assume on an everyday basis. And, uh, and uh, well, your, uh, your uh, lecture certainly breaks barriers of, of our uh, digital encroached space. And uh, well, I, uh, going to the, uh, uh, to the, uh, uh, th what you were talking about. Uh, just, uh, I, I particularly liked what, when you said that there's so much low inside the city that it becomes invisible. And uh, I uh, made me think there's this book that, that I've been reading. Uh, it's called 99% in Invisible City and it speaks uh, about uh, various signs, uh, uh, various constructions within the city that we don't notice. But what I uh, was thinking when I was reading this book that, that all of these signs and all of these constructions are there because of the low. So actually low is also this 99% this invisible within the city. Uh, I don't know if you could uh, perhaps elaborate on this point about the low scape a little bit more. Thank you, Miroslav, and thanks so much. I didn't manage to thank you for inviting me. It's been uh, it's a real pleasure to be here in this graduate conference and uh, I've, I've been looking at the program and I thought that's absolutely exciting what people are doing and how uh, kind of a, almost a, an inexhaustible fountain of, of inspiration cities can be. Um, and um, before I answer your question, Miroslav, I just want to say something about how I started with this uh, city, which was essentially an obsession for me. I, uh, I'm, I've always been in cities, I, I don't know how the countryside works, and I, I, I'm, I'm really interested in the kind of uh, the, the intensity of, uh, of the city, both in terms of conflict and in terms of coming together uh, in communities. Um, but something that has always occurred to me is that, first of all, there are different kinds of lawscapes and different, different, different lawscapes. Um, and, um, and hence, you know, the, the editor volume, Law in the City, that I edited uh, must be about, wow, maybe two year, 20 years ago now? No, am I? No, 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 no. Not, not 10, 20, I think, or well, like 15 maybe, well, right? Okay. It's 2007, yeah. I think. Uh, thank you. So um, things have changed, lots of things have changed, but um, the idea was that each, each um, contributor were going to, to write about a particular city. Uh, a city that they knew, not necessarily a city that they lived in. And the reason for which I wanted this to be like that, it was I imagined it a little bit like a city guide for the <laughs> for the intellectual legal scholar or something like that. But it was it was in order to understand a little bit about how each author, each thinker, um, found oneself in a city from a legal point of view. And this legal point of view, as I said, is a very broad thing. It's not just that the written text is, is, I think the law is pretty much everywhere. And as you said, Mirasa, it just takes a little bit of noticing and then, <laughs> then it becomes a little bit asphyxiating. Um, when um, when I, I play the lawscape, because it's a bit of a game that I often do with um, my students, uh, and I ask them to start noticing aspects of the lawscape, um, that is aspects in which space and law, or city and law are becoming, becoming one. Um, most of the students come back with almost breathing problems because they say there's, there's no way out. Everything is law and everything is space. And, and okay, so where is space for resistance, space for this, space for... And so you can imagine that the discussion is really interesting. Um, however, the, there is something that sort of saves us, saves us from, from this legal imperialism I was talking about. And this is this ability of the lawscape. And I think this is an ontological ability. This is an ability of the actual concept and form to almost like, an equal, like a sound equalizer. At points to have more space, at points to have more law visible. So 
quite often we walk around and we don't even realize that we actually constantly follow the law or or indeed ignore the law or create new laws whatever it is but we always into some sort of uh interaction with with the law and um so we this means that we 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 need to invisibilize the law or indeed ontologically put that the lawscape needs to invisibilize the legal part of it and just become space because otherwise it's just incredibly hard to to live it's it just becomes a prison it becomes indeed the city becomes uh, a concentration camp or or a prison where the space is completely replaced by law and everything all surfaces pulsate with legal indictment and there's no absolutely no way out there so think about cities under lockdown i mean this is we have experienced precisely that we have experienced the the kind of manic uh, manic explosion of law within the lawscape um perhaps for good reasons i'm not saying that this is this is always a bad thing and that's why when i started i said that these tools these three gifts are neither good nor bad they're things that one uses and depending on the context one can carry on with them so on one hand it's an ontological necessity of the lawscape because otherwise it cannot carry on if it becomes too much like law or too without law too much let's say empty space both these things are of course ontologically impossible but let's say let's imagine for a moment that there is space without law and there's law that is aspatial um that would become untenable the lawscape will collapse and that is why the moment in which the law that the lawscape drops the legal presence um it becomes an atmosphere it becomes this woolly moment of consumerism it becomes like a shopping mall it becomes the duty free at airports um it becomes this moment where the law is completely pushed in the background and and the city is is opened up um for our pleasure and nothing else no thank you thank you for for elaborating on this and rest and surprise yeah, through that that the city under lockdown is uh, actually i had uh, what, what last year in in the hardest lockdown of them all uh i had this spot that that the city under lockdown is a little bit like an airport there's like mm -hmm. you can only go to certain places there are signs and controls everywhere patrols uh, patrols uh, police and uh, in some cases soldiers and and the law was much more visible perhaps yeah. in this this uh, airport like uh, empty in a city uh, so mm -hmm. not to monopolize the discussion do we have any questions from the audience please don't be shy uh, so i can continue it's fine but, uh, i do have a question yeah, yeah so thank you very much professor for your uh, lecture this uh really interesting and uh so my question is i would like to understand why you start with a white shirt and then you um you finish with a black one um thank you camille uh i um and thank you for pointing to the performative aspects or performance aspects of of this performance lecture i'm really interested in in reaching out through various means and as you can probably imagine the, the the clothing and the change of clothing is an important moment it's not so much about the white and the and the black but it's more about this moment where while i talk about this warm blanket the one needs around one's shoulders on a chilly evening um it's the moment that i take this this thing off um because i think it's it's really important to first of all i like conflicting messages <laughs> i like the idea that i can say one thing but i can open up the possibility of another thing through whatever the visual or whatever it is that i use in in my um in the performance lectures of this type um and 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 i think the second thing is this that this one the white the white thing is actually a um what's it called a, a sword fighting um outfit 
um, and it's uh, it's quite a it's quite a particular thing. It's you know it's it's a it's a it's a thing. It, it you know that has a strap that goes, <laughs> um, and you know it serves a particular purpose. But what I like about it is that it's it's meant to protect you in a way. It's it's part of a protective um, garment, but it's also about fighting. And the lawscape is a little bit about fighting. It's a bit about you know trying to find one's place in am amongst other bodies and say you know what well, this is this is what I'm trying to do. This is how I'm dealing with other bodies, with the law, with myself, with all that stuff. It's a constant constant space of questioning, as opposed to that you know black or whatever the absence of color, which is this moment of lack of questioning. And that's the atmosphere for me. The atmosphere is this comfort. I mean, this is a really nice comfortable shirt. I've had it for you know twenty years, and I bought it in Berlin, and still reminds me of this light, lovely uh, late afternoon shopping in Berlin. You know, all that pleasure thing. Um, and somehow the idea that you can still go back to this comfort zone um, and say that, um, you know, I'm safe here um, is, is for me quite a strong symbolic moment. Um, but what I would like to dwell is this on is this idea that one can, um, I mean, listening to, to the earlier introduction, I think it's a really important thing to, um, when you present your work, to really try and think of different ways of presenting it, using your body, using the physical spaces, you know, using using stuff, take risks, and um, and and while I think, you know, okay, I I, I practice art as well as I practice law, or, you know, academic, uh, academically speaking, at least not not in real life, uh, but um, but these practices I found that they have a lot in common. And so when I'm when I've decided when Miroslav and I decided that okay I'm not going to do a kind of regular lecture but I'm going to do a performance lecture, the idea of a performance lecture is to bring body uh, space uh, different visual aspects objects uh, plants you know that stuff uh, and various voices like you know myself giving instructions and all that stuff into the game so that it composes first of all an atmosphere in which I'm inviting you. And secondly, um, a non-straightforward message. So the messages have to be multiple, have to be, you know, a little bit like you you wondering about this. I think there are many points in the in the performance that people might think, well, what, what, why was he doing that? And what, what was that about this? Or wait, and and to be honest, not everything has to be explained. Some things can stay, you know, as they are. So I would urge all of you to just experiment a bit more with you, you know the way you present things and start little by little um, and and then just go crazy <laughs> yeah yeah speaking of metaphors i must say that that when you you show well, i've seen it before as i said but but again seeing how you present the lowscape as as this castle and oriental carpet and then it's when you start looking into it it starts unraveling it so <laughs> and you see this this points it's, it's fantastic uh, metaphor and uh, sorry uh again i'm speaking uh maybe some other person has a question if i may just add sure. it's, like, i i really appreciated your your answer it's really interesting to to hear from you because i only talk about the the change in color and not the fact of removing the the white thing so it's um yeah. it's really fascinating how the performance can open us to uh different interpretations just as law does so it's really interesting yeah thank you exactly no i thank you because you put it beautifully and that's exactly exactly what it is is that law doesn't have one meaning despite the fact that quite often we think that in order to reach justice, there's only one way of interpreting the law. But in fact, the law by definition cannot just be interpreted in one way, in exactly the same way as art. I mean, my intention, just like the intention of the, uh, uh, you know, of the lawmaker, whatever it is, is only to some extent important. I'm not saying that it's not important. I'm not saying that, you know, the text doesn't belong to the author at all, but, but it takes a different life. It becomes a different thing. And as such, I think it's really important to, to bear this in mind, this, this possibility of different interpretations. So, no, thank you very much for putting it so clearly. Okay, and I see Mariana has a question. Yes, uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, I, 
it was a bit scary for me, in fact. <laughs> and it, it took me back, I think last semester, we learned about um, theoretic, in our, one of our topics in theoretical approaches to law, our uh, professor told us that we don't have to see law in one perspective. So in fact, what you did, it took me back to that, uh, uh, the theory, our theoretical approaches to law, what our professor was telling us. But in fact, it was scary. I don't know. <laughs> At a point, I didn't want to watch it. <laughs> so I don't know whether you, you have a sense that somebody will be scared with this. I don't know. <laughs> I, don't know. I, I, wasn't hoping, I wasn't hoping to scare you. I'm sorry, Mariana. And I hope you don't get bad dreams about it. Uh, but it, it, you know, atmospheres quite often are a bit scary. But I think I was playing with this idea of, of inside and outside and uh, whether I'm here or I'm not here. So it was a little ghostly, I know. But that's, I mean, a ghost is the perfect, not even a metaphor, the perfect appearance or disappearance, whatever, of this inside outside thing. So it is part of our world and ghost is part of our world, but also not. So when I was kind of slowly coming in, and uh, I wasn't hoping to scare you as much as make you think about this, this point of, of, of the inside and the outside, this limit between the two, the fact that there is no outside, that everything is already included in here, but we still need to imagine that we can cross that boundary. You know, it's a little bit like, you know, wanting to live forever. I mean, we don't want to accept that death is the end of it. So we just, we, we come up with all sorts of constructions, religion, metaphysics, um, science, anything that, that guarantees an outside. And sometimes it's a little disappointing there. Anyway, thank you. I think it's an eye opener. I never knew I could see this era. <laughs> Only that I know that my professor said we have to focus on other things for in law. You don't have to focus on one aspect or one perspective. But I never knew I would meet this. Thank you so much. You're welcome, Mariana. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Mariana, for, for this. And any other questions or comments? No. Okay. Uh, well, then we, can, we have three minutes left, so I guess... Uh, Press if you could uh, tell us some more, perhaps, how did you arrive at this point where you said being law professor is in this classical understanding is not enough. Uh, I want to experience uh, being an artist as well and use it in law. Yeah, thank you. I think this is a really important question because it really focuses on what the law is. And unfortunately, in, in, uh, in most of law schools, um, we understand law in a very narrow way, and we're doing a disservice to law, to the legal complexity, by understanding law simply as a text, simply as something that we encounter in courts, or, a, you know, whatever, in, in the lawyer's room, offices, and stuff like that. Um, I think the law is much more complex and much more embodied and spatialized. And I think the people who participate in this conference know this by instinct, if, if not by study, that, that the city is is the law and we have to treat it as that it's not just a metaphor for the law it's not just a place where we can observe the law but through the city the thing becomes the law and in a way i was i started i've always been i've always had an art practice but um but it was separate so i you know while i was doing my phd in law um i wasn't thinking about art together with what I was doing. Um, so I even had a, a, a pseudonym. I was working at the artist. Andreas was a different different person in a way and, and all that. So I was doing whatever I was doing differently. And then it was only recently, I must say, when I realized, especially when I started um, doing some performances, but for, for legal academics, you know, sort of uh, either conferences or, you know, whatever, or bringing the law into the, into the, the performance, performance art, um, that I've realized that there's a, there's, this is not just an opportunity to do two things at the same time. No, it's more important than that. It's an ethical responsibility to remain and to push the limits of interdisciplinarity in a way that will, they will push the law outside of its comfort zone. It will make the law think about itself very differently to what you know, we all used to when we study the law in, in, in our faculties or even when we teach it. So it started a little bit with what I was teaching with my students and, and doing all sorts of things. And then I realized that quite often, you know, in the two hours teaching, 
um, at least you know half an hour was dedicated to uh, what we call exercises or something like that. So we can we were taking the concepts and we're applying them in sort of various games or making or mapping or, or movement or something like that, and trying to understand how the particular case, how the particular concept, how the particular legal construction could be played out. And, you know, but it was fun. I mean, you're not, you know, it wasn't, you know, we weren't doing, we weren't making art, I have to, but we, we were really exploring pedagogical limits of law. And, and I realized that this is the way forward. It's, uh, for me, it's art, but for other people, it's other things. I mean, I do, I do also geography, psychoanalysis, as, as you kindly mentioned at the beginning. So there's all these ways of sort of shaking up the law and making us understand that the law is everywhere. And by only saying that the law is the text, we actually subscribe to this strange, antiquated ideal of the law as universal, as abstract, as something away from us. But if we make the law the city, the bodies, the movement between different bodies, the way that we, I shout across the, the street, if we make the law like that, we make the law much more easy to, to manage and we make it a proper, um, tool of, of social transformation. We understand the law as something much closer to us rather than an ivory tower where you need to be a, a lawyer in order to understand and play with it. So I think it is an ethical responsibility of all of us to bring the law in contact with other disciplines, other practices and other, other concepts. Okay, uh, thank you, Andreas. And we have one last question from the audience I, in the chat. Uh, I don't know if you can uh, see. Yeah. Mm. Okay, yeah. So I took your fencing, uh, Edward says, I took your fencing jacket as a formal legal straight jacket, constraining you, protecting you from yourself. Where do you think this fetish for constraints and boundaries in legal academia comes from? Yeah, so Edward, I, okay, I now know why you didn't ask <laughs> this question orally, because usually uh, we know the answers to the questions we ask. Um, so I would like to know where your fetish uh, of the law and of law as constrained come from. Um, mine is quite simple, I think. I mean, obviously, you know, what's wrong with a bit of fetish and a bit of constraint. But I think it's also about um, ways in which we are brought up. Um, quite often we have the law in our houses, whether it's in the form of the father authority, the mother authority, the family authority, whatever it is. And so we know how we, we growing up and quite often, you know, that, that standard moment of the mother or the father who actually, uh, you know, when we were kids and our parents would just put uh, a little, I don't know, a little cardigan on top of us or a little coat or something and say, button up, it's cold, or the scarf like that. That, that is a legal moment. That is a really important legal moment where we kind of understand that in order to be, you know, we need to be protected. And these dispositifs, these kind of, you know, instruments of the law allow us to feel protected. So, um, so yes, it's a straight jacket, uh, but also, as you say uh, very correctly, it's it's a protection, but also it's a, it's a little bit of a fetish. And I think that's, that's a general thing, because I thought that I didn't like the law until uh, even though all my degrees are in law. Um, um, but then I realized that, yeah, there's something about this constraint that uh, I'm interested in exploring, both positively and negatively. Okay, yeah, thank you, Andres. I don't see any other questions. That probably are out of time anyway. So thank you. Thank you once again uh, for this wonderful, I, I couldn't think of a better opening for, for a conference to inspire all of us to, to cross the boundaries uh, of law and space uh, in, in the many, many pres excellent presentations that <laughs> I'm sure, uh, I'm sure we'll all hear. Thank you. Thank you, Andres. Wonderful. Have a wonderful conference and absolutely good luck with everything that you do. And whatever you need, um, you can easily send me an email. You can find my work on on uh, on the net and also, but I'm happily, I'll happily send you PDFs and stuff like that if you need to go deeper into any of these issues. So good luck with everything. Thank you, Miroslav, and thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you once again. And let me just uh, remind you that right now we'll have a short break and we'll reconvene in 10 minutes in the respective panels. Uh, the links to the panels may be found in the full program on our website. Thank you for, for taking the time. Have a great day.